everyone. So, a while back, I put together a video which charted a graphics card upgrade path for users looking to upgrade from a 1080p screen to a 1440p display. Methodology here was pretty straightforward. I took two of the most popular GPUs of all time, GTX 970 and GTX 1060, benched them at 1080p, then suggested the closest equivalent hardware that delivered the same performance or better at 1440p. So yeah, that is a pretty straightforward idea, providing a GPU upgrade path that ensures that moving to a higher density display won't result in a loss of performance. Today I'm going to do the same thing, but this time we're going to see what kind of horsepower you need to hit native 4K rendering. Now look, we can't benchmark every single game. There will be variances on a title by title basis, as we shall see. But with the data we do have available, the same candidates emerge pretty consistently. So yeah, there's a trend there. And with that trend in place, we can draw broad conclusions about the upgrade path you need to take to deliver the same 4K performance that you're getting now at 1080p. However, I am going to widen out the scope of the data somewhat. Last time around, I did choose GTX 970 and 1060 as the baseline GPUs there. This time we're doing things a little differently. According to the Steam hardware survey, GTX 1060 is still the number one most common GPU on the market, so that card remains in place for our testing. But to shake things up a bit, I'm also going to include the most popular AMD card, which right now is RX 580. And something else the Steam hardware survey tells me is that more powerful cards are moving up the list. The top five now includes GTX 1070 and GTX 1660 Ti. Can that level of 1080p performance be guaranteed at 4K? So before we head on into the data, let's illustrate the scale of the problem here. 4K is 2160p, a doubling of 1080p resolution on both the horizontal and vertical axes. 8.3 million pixels to paint versus around 2.1. I honestly think that a GPU has better things to do than to service frankly insane pixel counts like this, and we'll talk about that later, but 4K itself as a display space, a canvas for gaming if you like. Well, that was the target for the enhanced consoles, it is the primary target for PS5 and Xbox Series X, and the 4K display standard is now firmly established. But let's dig into the data and see what we can see before I go into much more depth there. Let's kick off with a genuine GPU mangler, Assassin's Creed Odyssey. It's a game that doesn't particularly enjoy running on AMD hardware for some reason. The RX 580 generally tends to benchmark a little bit higher than 1060 in many games, but certainly not in this one where average frame rates give the 1060 an 11% advantage. Still, this is a truly demanding game and in terms of 2160p scalability, the graph lines here speak for themselves. It's RTX 2080 and 2080 Super that match or exceed 1060 and 580 performance. Interestingly, Radeon 7 is in the same ballpark as the 2080 here and I suspect that 1080 Ti may well do the job too. Unfortunately, AMD has no consumer level GPU left in production uh, that gets the job done. Radeon 7 has been discontinued now and it seems to be getting a new life rebadged as a prosumer card. Anyway, let's reset the 1080p target now and factor in 1660 Ti and indeed 1660. RTX 2080 Ti doesn't quite match uh, the 1660 Ti's output, but it handily exceeds the standard 1660. Data also shows the RTX 2080 Ti at 4K beating the non-overclocked version of the Radeon RX 5600 XT. My gut feeling here is that AMD has some pretty severe driver issues with AC Odyssey that manifest at lower resolutions. These results, they just don't seem to make sense for Team Red hardware. Let's look at another demanding game next, Shadow of the Tomb Raider on its highest settings. Balance is restored to the force here. RX 580 at 1080p outperforms 1060 and does so by 11%. But it's actually rather difficult to scale up to a higher resolution. AC Odyssey saw RTX 2080 getting the job done in delivering the 1060's full HD performance at 4K. But here you can see that the 2080 Ti is required. Now you do get a performance uplift at least, and in that respect, 4K 2080 Ti performance is on par with 580. 
But yeah, 2080 Super can't even match the 1060's Full HD showing. One thing that's curious though is that in the middle segment in the forest, RTX 2080 Ti suddenly takes a giant leap in performance terms over the other cards measured here. Curious result this because an average FPS measurement across all three segments would show 2080 Ti faster overall, when really it's only got an advantage in that middle forest segment. Enough of a boost in fact to skew the average. Now generally speaking there are all manner of potential explanations for the higher requirement uh, from Shadow of the Tomb Raider, but let's remember that while GPU vendors can scale compute, scaling memory bandwidth to match is really, really challenging. Suffice to say, AMD has nothing that gets close here. Radeon 7 has just 89% of 2080 Super's performance and just 75% of RTX 2080 Ti's power. It also goes without saying that no GPU currently exists in the consumer space that can run this game at 4K with the full HD output of 2070 or 1660 Ti. RTX 2080 Ti at 4K lags behind 1660 at 1080p in the first and third segments with 1660 Ti way ahead. In the second forest area of this benchmark, 2080 Ti manages to push higher, getting closer to 1660's 1080p performance. It's a similar situation with Far Cry 5, which is a game we identified as being pretty heavy on memory bandwidth when we first took a look at it on PC way back when. There's a 70.2 FPS average on 1060 rising to 72.8 on RX 580, both at 1080p naturally. Only one card manages to match that at 4K, RTX 2080 Ti, uh, 74.5 frames per second there. 2080 Super at 4K delivers about 90% of the 1060's Full HD output. Now look, obviously you can tweak settings to equalise performance and do so without too much of an impact on visuals. But really this is about resolution, the insane demands of 4K in many scenarios. And we'll talk about that a bit more at the end of the video. Suffice to say that when you look at 1660 Ti 1080p frame rates way ahead of 2080 Ti at 4K, 2080 Ti is about 10% off 1660's Full HD output. Thing is, there are some games where, just like Assassin's Creed Odyssey, we do see decent scalability. There's the sense that CPU limits may be holding back our scores on that particular game, but that's definitely not the case with this one. Ghost Recon Wildlands are ultra settings. This is one of the most tremendous GPU workouts I've seen, for some reason, and the benchmark at least barely touches the CPU. Seemingly quite heavy on GPU compute, but this does mean that we see some decent scalability across resolutions. 1060 and 580 complete the bench at 1080p, with scores just under 40 frames per second. 39.7 on 1060, 38.1 on 580. At 4K, Radeon 7 can't quite hit either of those targets, but RTX 2080 sits between our 1080p champion's performance level. This means that 2080 Super goes further, inching ahead of the 1060's Full HD output. There's a close grouping on the chart here though, right? Not much in it. So how about a more challenging test then? Matching 1660Ti's Full HD performance at 4K. Well, once again, RTX 2080 Ti sits between the two 1080p cards we're looking at here when it's rendering at 4K. Let's move on and take a return trip to Novigrad in The Witcher 3 then, where we see a result that is more Ghost Recon than Far Cry 5. Well, depending on how you look at it really, GTX 1060 delivers a 66.6 .6 frames per second average at 1080p, but 580 is a ton faster at 74.2 an 11 point lead for Team Red. RTX 2080 Ti delivers more performance at 4K than the 580 does at 1080p, but the level of variance changes throughout the bench. As things stand, the 2080 Super at Ultra HD is a couple of points shy of the 1060's performance level at the lower resolution. If we look at the more challenging 1080p outputs set by 1660 and 1660 Ti, you'll see that 2080 Ti at Ultra HD sits just above 1660, but doesn't trouble 1660 Ti. I'll be honest though, the fact that 2080 Ti at 4K gets anywhere near 1660 Ti at 1080p on any game is massively surprising. When I went into this one, I expected all of the results to look more like The Witcher 3 here. 
So I could go on, but I think the point has been made. RTX 2080, 2080 Super, they can get the job done on a range of games and I strongly suspect that reasonable tweaking will deliver a strong 4K performance from those cards. You trade some higher end graphical features to claw back that frame rate. And yeah, with that in mind, where the 2080 does well, you should find that Radeon 7 and its old sparring partner, 1080 Ti, they should also deliver reasonably good performance, not far off that level. There are plenty of used 1080 Ti's on the market, but yeah, Radeon 7, I suspect that will become more of a collector's item. In the fullness of time, its 16 gigabytes of frame buffer memory may well bring about a bit of a renaissance, but well, we'll just have to wait and see there. In terms of raw horsepower to cover all eventualities, we're still missing the definitive 4K upgrade, in my opinion. I can say that because my go-to game for causing a benchmarking nuisance says so, as it always does. Yes, of course, Crisis 3. 1060 and 580 are pretty much tied here at 1080p, with average frame rates between 78 to 79 frames per second. In this scenario, 2080 Ti lags behind massively at 4K, delivering just 86% of the 1060's 1080p performance level. And yes, suffice to say, 1660 Ti presents an altogether more stringent challenge. If my maths is right, you'd need to increase RTX 2080 Ti's 4K rendering output by 55% to match 1660 Ti's 1080p performance level. So yeah, you might have seen those stories online saying that Nvidia's next-gen Ampere architecture delivers a 50% gen-on-gen boost in performance. And in the extreme cases, like we're seeing here, I'd say that it's gonna be needed. But needless to say, nothing performance-wise on Ampere in terms of consumer cards or indeed any card has been confirmed as of yet. I've got some notes here I'd like to share about the whole 4K business. Put simply, I'm not really a fan of 4K displays for PC. I tried a 32-inch 2160p screen for a while, and the pixel density was still too high for 100% desktop scaling, and I'm really not keen on the blur when Windows scales higher. Meanwhile, 1440p at 27 inches is just great. It's far more comfortable for me. Now, maybe it's different for you. But I guess the main reason we're talking about 4K at all is that it's swiftly becoming the standard for the living room. And therein lies the issue. The jump from 1080p to 4K, and now with 8K on the horizon, these are unprecedented leaps in pixel density. And it's taking years for PC hardware to catch up. I mean, I first tested 4K back in 2013 uh, with GTX 780 and SLI took a further three years for GTX 1080 to deliver reasonable 4K performance and another year beyond that to get to 1080 Ti, the first truly viable Ultra HD performer. But even then, there are scenarios where dynamic resolution scaling or sub-native rendering can significantly boost performance and you really don't lose that much in the way of image quality on a 4K screen. Temporal anti-aliasing and temporal upscaling solutions are changing the way games look and throwing raw pixel count through a game engine produces diminishing returns the higher up the resolution chain you go. You look at a game like uh, The Division 2 and 75% native rendering resolution produces a very significant performance win and the subsequent impact to image quality is fairly minimal. These techniques are only going to improve going forward. Even as things stand, the performance implications here are fascinating. So I've got a benchmark here that illustrates this. Far Cry 5, 2080 Ti native 4K performance stacked up against 2070 Super with the game's internal resolution scaler running at full pixel count, 90% and 80%. And yeah, 80% of 4K on a 2070 Super is on par point for point with 2080 Ti. And what are you losing here? A touch of clarity and that's it. The thing is though, times are changing, developer attitudes are evolving. Game makers aren't as interested in native resolution rendering as perhaps you might be. They are more concerned by new advances in rendering, putting that extra GPU power to good use in different ways. The most spectacular case in point recently would be the Unreal Engine 5 tech demo running in real time on PlayStation 5. So here's the thing, it's using temporal anti-aliasing. Temporal accumulation, yep, it's using that too. And it spends most of its time rendering out at around 1440p. 
Epic provided press with lossless 2160p output screenshots and they defied our traditional pixel counting techniques. We could tell that some of the shots were of a sub-native rendering resolution, but only through magnification in Photoshop. Again, increasing resolution, you might gain a bit of extra clarity, but nothing game-changing. So perhaps we're seeing the dawn of a new rendering paradigm here, and another example of what we're calling the post-resolution era of gaming. The 8.3 million pixels on a 4K screen, think of them as more of a canvas for developers to paint on, as opposed to a rigid, uncompromisable pixel grid that's 3840 pixels wide by 2160 deep. Another great example here, control with the full ray tracing feature set. Running on RTX 2080 Ti, it looks incredible on a 4K screen. It runs supremely well, bearing in mind that every ray tracing feature is in effect here. But it is using NVIDIA's AI upscaling technology, DLSS, to produce these results at high frame rates. Now, it's not native resolution, but it looks superb. And frankly, I don't care if it isn't native. Reconstruction is freeing up enough GPU power to deliver all of those ray tracing features with no undue impact on performance. That's a winner in my book. In the here and now though, that's it. Those are the recommendations I have for you. We've got 2080, 2080 Super, 2080 Ti in the here and now, and those are the cards to get for 4K gaming. They're also fully compliant with DirectX 12 Ultimate, which I recommend for any future-proofing purchase in the GPU space. But remember, by the end of the year, we'll also have DX12 Ultimate compatible contenders, new cards from both AMD and Nvidia to consider, and I can't wait to check them out. But that's all from me for now, which means it's signing off time, which of course entails a request from me to you. Several requests, in fact. The like button is there for the pressing. The concept of subscribing may also be known to you. It's a good thing. There's also the bell there that delivers our subscribers instant notifications whenever we post new content. And for those that love what we do, please consider the DF Patreon. Your support helps us to produce the content we want to produce in a world where YouTube ad revenue doesn't cover costs. But that's all from me for now. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of this one, if indeed you did. And on a more general level, thanks for watching and supporting Digital Foundry.